Hello and welcome to the joint service of Peace Lutheran Church of Pico Rivera and St. John's Lutheran Church of North Long Beach. We welcome you to our service. Today is Reformation Sunday, and we're thankful that God has led you to be with us on our online service today. Your presence is truly a gift from God, and may he bless our worship time together. I am Pastor Mike Robelch, and I'll be leading the service today. I'm one of the pastors at Peace Lutheran Church in Pico Rivera, and the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in North Long Beach. If you would like to receive copies of the bulletin and sermon prior to our service, please email us at P-E-A-C-E-L-U-T-H-C-H -E at gmail.com or send a DM to us on either of our two Facebook pages, Peace Lutheran Church of Pico Rivera or St. John's Lutheran Church, North Long Beach. And I ask that you join in the responsive readings during the course of the service. We begin our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. On this year confession, I, by the virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is the feast of victory for our God. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, 
with an internal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who has made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. These are the words of life. Please join in the uh, responsive reading of the psalm. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. God is our strength, our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Our epistle lesson for today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what is becoming of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. These are the words of life. According to St. John, the eighth chapter. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is this that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he takes us to the very heart and soul of what he wants to say to Christians in Rome, and as well to all of us who read this letter after them. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. Apart from the works of the law? That is really weird. How can it be that one is justified apart from the works of the law? We hold that one is justified by his performance of the works of the law. Isn't that what the Ten Commandments are there for? Doesn't God need our help? If we are to be justified by our performance of the works of the law, then how are we justified before God? Perhaps the following verse will help us. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. These are shocking words. These are because not because it's what we expect, it's because we don't expect this. And they are disturbing words too, because it is not all the way we think one is justified before God. First of all, if these words are true, it means that all of our striving to justify ourselves before God on the basis of our performance of works of the law is both useless and worthless. In fact, it's worse than worthless. It's downright sinful. It's contrary to the word in his way. We put our trust and confidence in our own performance and the good works that God says, it doesn't count anything with me. That's hard to take. It doesn't help your standing with me. It doesn't make me love you anymore. And we respond saying, but it should. Second of all, if one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, then there is no difference between one person and another in the eyes of God. This means that he rewards the one who does little work, the same as he does one that does much work, the same as the one who doesn't do any work. And we say, that's not fair. Third of all, if one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, how are we to make the distinctions among ourselves that we like to make? How are we to distinguish between the righteous and the really righteous and the really, really righteous if it's not according to the works of the law? This poses a very real threat to my self-esteem, which is based on my self-righteousness, which is based on how my life compares with others which is based on the performance of the works of the law. And we say, I want to be recognized. You want to, to know your unbelieving friends, don't, why they don't embrace the Christian faith. When you tell them one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, it's for the same reason you and I don't. It's not fair. I don't get any recognition and I don't have to earn it. Actually, I wish that these words upset us more than they do. I wish people would hear these words and be either outraged or terrified that the basis for them in their confidence before God is now exposed for what it is, nothing but sinking sand. I wish that they would get so upset in hearing that the foundation of their life before God that they thought was built on a solid foundation of their great performance is really right on a great fault line and will open up 
and make everything they thought would save them disappear. Maybe then they would ask, then how can we be saved? Maybe then they would demand to know more. How are then are we to be justified before God if not by the works of the law? Then maybe they would listen, which is really what God wants, just to be still and do nothing. This word is God's word. It's not our word. It's not even Paul's word. And by the word, the righteousness of God is being made known to you. The righteousness of God, which is apart from the law, is now being made known to you. And the real shocker to all your pride is it's not so much that you need to hear this word as it is that God wants to speak it. He wants to declare it. He wants to make his righteousness known to you and to me. His righteousness is based not on our performance, but on the magnificent performance of the works of the law by his only begotten, dearly beloved son, Jesus Christ. By his bloody cross, by his glorious resurrection, by his ascension to the right hand of God, by his sending of the Holy Spirit, by his baptism, by his holy supper, by his word preached, and by his gifts poured out upon you and me, we are justified before God. Sadly, not many are bothered by their standing before God nowadays. They're bothered by the price of gasoline, wars and rumors of wars throughout the world, climate change, the economy, and the list goes on and on. But when it comes down to how we are justified by God, no one seems to care. Perhaps in medi the medieval times, people suffered from guilt and an anxious conscience before God. But is that true anymore? Sometimes it seems as though we have the ultimate cure for the most deadly disease there is, and we can't get anyone interested. Isn't there something more, more relevant to be saying that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law? And the answer is, of course, a resounding no. There is nothing more urgent or more important or more critical than to know how is one justified before God. And so very often, the first thing that needs to happen before we can share the good news of the gospel with others, before we are ready to hear the words for ourselves, we need to speak the law. We need to hear the law convict us of our sin. And that's just what Paul does with the Romans between chapter 1, verse 17, and chapter 3, verse 21. Whether you're feeling confident about your standing with God according to the works of the law, or if you find that you, you're really not too interested in the whole issue, you need to read Romans 1, verse 18 through verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 21. It will destroy your self-righteousness and jolt your complacency, and you'll be ready to shut up and listen. The law is good for a lot of things. It's good for society and for restraining evil. The law is necessary for keeping law and order. It's good for forcing us to do more than we would normally do. But the law will never justify you before God. In fact, it makes matters worse for you with God. Here's a simple example I'll, I'll borrow from a Lutheran theologian. Take a traffic light. Traffic lights are good and necessary things. They're critical to maintaining an orderly flow of traffic on the road. Traffic lights are all about the law, and they are good things. How many accidents do you suppose are prevented by traffic lights? But traffic lights don't stop sin. In fact, they create sin in, in us. Do you like it when the traffic light turns red and the light says stop? Not many of us do. Do you ever speed up when the light turns yellow to squeeze through the intersection before it turns red 
hoping that you don't get caught. Maybe a long red light will make you impatient. Maybe you think unpleasant thoughts about the driver in front of you for not moving out quickly enough. The law stirs up those thin, sinful thoughts and makes even words or gestures come out of us that we normally wouldn't do. But just suppose that we were to take a new approach to things and join the Society for the Admiration and Veneration of Traffic Lights. Would that be the end of our sinning? Probably not. In fact, it would probably be just the beginning of a new kind of sin, even worse than the before, the sin of pride. Now we would begin to make distinctions between ourselves and those miserable traffic light haters. We could use that today on people who receive the vaccination and those who don't. We see it in our society as we speak. But we know whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So every mouth, everyone may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, even though the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law shows us who we really are and that what we're really made of. And if we hear it honestly, and as it is written for us to hear, we can only come away with the feeling of how can we be justified by God? How then can I be saved? And when the law of God has this effect on us, we know that the law is good. For now we are ready to hear the gospel. But now the righteousness of God has been made known to us apart from the law. But now means that God is overruling all of our objections, all of our protests. He has taken away our false sense of security and demolished all the false pretenses. But now he has not left us to spoil and perish, but now he has acted. The righteousness of God is by faith in Jesus Christ not according to thou shall and thou shall not, but according to I shall and it is finished. In our response to what must I do to be saved, God in Christ has answered, believe in me and you will be saved. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one, not even you and me, that are excluded from this righteousness of God. The qualifications are that you must be a sinner in need of a Savior and that you cannot save yourself. To deny your sin or that you are a sinner is to exclude yourself from the justification by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus who God put forth as a propitiation, propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Propitiation is one of those $100 theologian words that means by his blood. Christ not only appeased the Father's anger regarding our sin, but by his blood, he also moved his Father to be pleased with you and me. Let me make one more illustration to sum all of this up. Suppose your son or daughter came to you one day and said, Mom, Dad, what must I do to become your child? What would you say? You might have to hold back the tears of sadness that your child felt the need to raise such a question in the first place. But what would you say? Would you present a list of things that they must do or standards they must meet? No. You probably say something like, sweetheart, there is nothing for you you must do, or there's nothing you can do because you are my child. I want you to listen to me and do as I say because I know what's best for you. But you will always be my child, and I will always love you simply because 
you are my child and not because of what you do and don't do. From this day forward, you must never ask, what must I do to be a child of God? Or what must I do to be justified before God or to attain the righteousness of God? Through water and the word, you have been born of God. You are his child. Just believe in it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us proclaim our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, keep us from craving and weeping after what we no longer possess, but instead give us contentment in the daily bread you so graciously rain down upon us. Lord, in your mercy, cause your Holy Spirit to rest on us and our pastors that they may prophesy your word publicly and faithfully amongst us, and we in turn may prophesy your word in our homes and vocations. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, bless our elders and our church council with the necessary gifts of your spirit, that they may faithfully serve the congregation, support our pastors, and uphold the ministry of the word amongst us. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, uphold our law enforcement and members of the military and all those who bear the sword in our land, that sin and wickedness may be kept at bay and we may live peaceable lives in security. Lord, in your mercy, save and raise up those who are suffering or sick, especially those that we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you know that we need, Grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his perfect peace. I'd like to thank Maria, our ASL interpreter, who makes this taping possible, along with Rory Selden and Katja Richardson, who provide our music. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, yes, we do have in-person Bible studies and services. At Peace Lutheran Church, we have two worship services, one at 9 and the other at 11 on Sunday mornings. Our 11 a.m. service is in Spanish. Our Bible study hour is 1015 to 1115. We're located at 9412 Shade Lane in Pico Rivera, California. For those of you who that may not be convenient or live in the Long Beach area, St. John's Lutheran Church, we worship at 12.30 p.m. 
We have Maria there for ASL signing. Our Bible study is at 145 to 245, and we're located at 6698 Orange Avenue in Long Beach. May God's perfect peace be with you this week and always. And if you would, help us share the word of God with our neighbors. Please hit like, subscribe, and don't forget to click on the bell so you're notified that anytime a new service or a new Bible study is uploaded, that you will be notified. Thank you for your attendance today, and may God bless you.